Um, but what I really want to talk about today is um, <laughs> what I want to talk about today is sort of where we are in the uh, growth path of Ruby and where I see we need to be. And I think um, we are at a point in Ruby where it's still very viable and something that gets a lot of accolades to go write yet another HTTP client. I'm not talking about US. Um, but all the people write in sort of the 20%, uh, write another testing library, and that's in vogue. But I think we're actually getting to the point where we're outgrowing that, and we need to actually start focusing on completeness and getting to the end. Um, if we don't do that, we're just forever going to be a blue slash scripting language that people use to script the JVM or people use to script C and don't actually, can actually build serious stuff in them. You could argue about whether that's important or not. I personally feel like getting Ruby to the point where it's a, uh, a real language that people do serious stuff in actually matters. Um, and I actually, to some degree, while I don't want to endorse everything Zed said, um, I actually kind of agree with Zed that Rails um, hold us back somewhat in that. So I'm going to talk today about, uh, about a little bit about that. I will serve as the official conference a little bit. Um, but I, I just want to talk about sort of where I hope Ruby goes. I definitely see two forks in the road. I think the popularity of JRuby definitely gives us the potential to be the scripting language for the JVM. But I don't think that's enough. I don't, I don't want that to be all we ever are. So, I want to start out by talking a little bit about what I see are the important bases of Ruby development. And I could spend, I could do a whole talk on this, and I could go along with Rangler, but I'm just going to talk about a few, a few big ones. So um, Ruby was developed for a few years. Um, then a bunch of people, mostly in Japan, but eventually outside of Japan, spent some time fleshing it out, writing standard library, etc. Rails came around in 2004. Um, that pretty much dominated the Ruby scene for a, a while, and I think uh, there was a lot of focus during that period of time on just building stuff A for the web and B, getting, like, being productive, getting out stuff that works, that solved the 820 rule. I think Rails epitomized the 820 rule, um, especially back when Rails was first created, it epitomized the 820 rule. So uh, a lot of the libraries that came out around during this period of time are very 820 rule libraries. And then, sort of around 2009, we started getting serious JRuby, serious Rubinius, people using uh, Ruby for serious things like Chef, right? And uh, what started to happen is that people started to notice that there are deficiencies that are not in the 80%, right? So most people don't ever hit these, but when you start writing uh, a high performance web server in Ruby, you start to hit deficiencies. And a lot of people, um, and we've heard some of that today, argue that that's okay because. Uh, you shouldn't care about, nobody cares about the 20%. Only a few people care about it, they can worry about it. But the fact of the matter is that the people who worry about it are actually building software for everyone else, right? So if you say that NetHTTP doesn't need to support streaming, for instance, then all that means is that all the 12 people who write the clients or the servers or whatever aren't going to end up being able to actually implement the things that are needed. And we saw that Wes actually wrote his own HTTP library because that HTTP wasn't good enough, right? So, and that probably took some time out of building FOD, but maybe it would be more uh, better to use building FOD. So we definitely have a problem in the Ruby community where I uh, think there's deficiencies, and a lot of the way that we deal with those deficiencies are by saying it's okay, 80-20 rule, everybody should build an HTTP client that solves the 80%. So I sort of consider the phases being these four phases. I don't really know where we're heading with the growing up phase, but I know that there's definitely been a shift in how people have talked about things in the past few years. Um, a lot of that has to do with there, have been, there are more implementations that are, that are to be taken seriously, and a lot of it has to do with Ruby, using Ruby for things other than uh, the web, which sort of brings us back to the beginning, right? So the growing up period is a lot like what, what I'm happy with the flushing out period, right? Where Ruby is being used for a lot of things, so the 80 20 rule doesn't really make as much sense because you can't really figure out where the 80% is. When everybody's focusing on web, it's actually really so, I want to talk a little bit about the standard library before I move on. I think it's much maligned. Um, but the standard library uh, serves as a foundation for a lot of other things. And if you go look at sort of a dependency graph of Ruby, you'll find that for all the people saying, you, don't, you know, nobody uses this library, that library, almost all the libraries in, in uh, Ruby are used somewhere. Um, some exceptions might be the RSS library, which isn't used that much because there, there is, in fact, a better one. 
But I think when people say a better one or there's a superior version of this, they really, they, almost nobody has actually looked at the code or tried to use it for advanced stuff. They just know they like the API better than the standard library has. And sort of the point of the standard library is not necessarily to build the best, prettiest, most awesome API in the world. It's to be complete. It's when you implement a protocol or a specification to actually get to the end. And uh, like I said, the standard library didn't do all that perfectly, but the standard library actually cares about that a lot. And so if you go look at something like NetHTTP or um, RexML, which is also much more line, you'll find that it's actually pretty complete. A lot of times it's slow, um, but these things are relatively robust, and also these things consider thread scenarios. So this is something that I think the vast majority of libraries written during the Rails era don't care about at all is threading. Part of that is because no Ruby web server that anybody uses except for JRuby servers actually have thread support. So if you turn on a config that threads a bang in a Rails app and put it in Passenger, you have not done anything. The Passenger doesn't actually serve multiple threads. And if you put a config that threads a bang in Unicorn, you have not done anything. And the Unicorn and Passenger guys will argue that it's okay. It doesn't matter. We think that that's a better way to serve apps. And that's fine, but the fact that there's no alternative solution that's actually any good for MRI that supports threads means that nobody can actually make that decision for themselves. Right? So nobody can actually be able to check to see whether threading mode would benefit their application because there's no way to actually try it. And I think that that's actually bad, and it's one of the reasons why the first five years of Ruby standard library development considered thread scenarios, and the next five years basically don't. So many, many libraries that exist out there don't really support um, threads, sometimes reasonably and sometimes at all, and it's very hard to tell. Right? So you just have Ruby developers that are cranking out libraries, and nobody, you can't tell what's broken because nobody actually runs things in thread mode. Um, the standard library, libraries tend to be in it for the long haul, which actually means that they tend to be somewhat cruffy, right? So um, in my mind, cruffiness for protocol libraries is probably a good thing. And I, maybe I'm, that's heresy a little bit, but I actually think that if you look at a library and it hasn't been updated that much, I, there were people who said in the, in the famous uh, uh, Ruby standard library the ghetto post, there were people who said, what you should do is check to see how often it's been updated. If it hasn't been updated recently, it probably means it's too old and it's been thrown out. I actually feel the opposite about things implementing protocols, right? If something implementing a protocol has been updated in a while, it probably means it's pretty good. It probably means it's serving its purpose. And um, what that means is that there's a lot of code in the standard library that was written before idiomatic Ruby became developed. And so there's a lot of code in NetHTTP and RexML and all these other things that people love to hate that is ugly, that don't, that uses curly braces for multi-line blocks is one thing that, that like glares out at you when you start to look at it. But honestly, the people who wrote them wrote them 10 years ago before we had these idioms. And the fact that someone uses code braces instead of do end is not actually a good reason to throw out a library and stuff like So, which begs the question, is the standard library stagnating? So, uh, there is this famous post, like I said, by Mike Carr, and he's like, go look at some of the code that's in the class that you've never used. Chances are it's from 10 years ago. It doesn't even look like idiomatic Ruby. I'm wondering what class you should so that higher, place, uh, higher quality replacements can take their place. Uh, so, like I said, expect that you should see some CROF protocol implementations. That doesn't mean that we should never go in and clean up the CROF, but it means that CROF does not necessarily equal bad library. It means old library, right? But that's okay. It might not actually be a great sign if you have a lot of churn in protocol libraries. You don't want that issue to be changing a lot. It's actually good that it's not. Um, and I would just say in general, from my perspective, when I'm using a library, something that is robust and complete actually beats something that is idiomatic. Idiomatic just means it was done recently. Um, and idiomatic obviously changes, right? Idiomatic C from 2010 may not be idiomatic C from 1990 or 1980 or 1970. And that's okay, it doesn't mean that a library written in 1980 is a bad library. People in C know that, right? People in Ruby don't really know that. Now, so I would say we need to pay more attention to what robust and complete means. We need to actually read the lib directory, like someone said, and see what's actually in there. So what changed about the Rails era? So first of all, the Rails, Rails itself is somewhat standard lib -ish. It somewhat follows the things that I said earlier about the standard library, right? It's, so it's robust, it's pretty complete. Uh, if you look at, for instance, all the code that handles the HTTP request and responses, a lot of code for like IIS, weird hacks, there's a full Unicode library written in C, it written in Ruby, in uh, Active Support, right? So there's all this weird crop, people talk about crop all the time, but at the end of the day, Rails actually solves a lot of problems. And uh, solves a lot of problems in a thing that Rails sort of pioneered, which is uh, maybe a pioneer of the Ruby community. 
which is trying to hide the fact that we're actually solving problems. So the stand, where the Ruby standard library solves problems in a way that's very obvious because there's an API around with the solution, Rails solves problems like dealing with HTTP for you in a very hidden way. So while there, so people have sort of, not only is there corrupt uh, internally, there is no corrupt in the API, so people are like, what is this code even doing? Why is that sports, or action, action control response even there? I don't understand. Right? But actually, it's doing a lot of important stuff, like generating e-tags for you in a secure way that is subject to timing vulnerability attacks. Right? So I know nobody cares about this stuff, but it actually matters. And so Rails itself ended up having the same sort of like, this is crafty, et etc. Et um, Rails itself, uh, sorry, so Rails, but Rails gems are a little bit different. Rails gems tend to not be robust and complete. They tend to do uh, very narrow targeted things, which is good, right? That's what a Rails plugin should be. It should implement some utility function, or it should implement an API, like the Twitter API. That's great. And uh, if it implements the part of the Twitter API that Rails developers care about, that's also fine. And we tended to get into a situation where people ever cared. Uh, a lot of people cared, they would just go and patch the Twitter API and give up which help. So we got a situation where the types of things that Rails developers were doing via plugins uh, were inherently narrower and tended to be uh, sort of not the sort of thing the standard library would do. If you wanted something that the standard library would do, typically if it was web related, it would go into Rails. Typically if it was not web related, it just didn't get done at all for like libraries. Um, sometimes it is, these libraries are robust. So uh, there are some libraries, whether you like them or not, like Devise or Paperclip, that have been around for a long time. They're very web specific, but they have, they've been around for long enough that they solve more than they just want to do. They solve a lot of problems. And then there's a lot of other libraries that are, there are 45 of them, and all of them solve the 80 20 of that particular guy, and there's not a lot of collaboration, and they're not very robust. So, um, this is what I mean, sometimes or less. These libraries are sometimes really good, but it's actually very hard to tell. There isn't a good ecosystem way of saying this library is awesome, this library is less awesome. And there's been attempts to solve it, right? but it's difficult. Um, you expect to have high churn. And this is actually not a bad thing for Rails plugins. Rails plugins are the sort of thing, the Twitter API chain use them, has to go rewrite the entire library. Right? That's fine, that's the sort of thing that Rails plugins are doing. You expect to see a lot of churn. Uh, not such a good thing is that we made a pragmatic decision as a community to just assume single threaded operation, which worked good as an 80-20 rule, and then when people started to actually do things like make web requests a lot inside of their requests, suddenly the single thread mode didn't help that much. So there, there was a talk here about concurrency in general, but the thing, the thing that I think everyone should know if they don't know yet about concurrency is that MRI and every, pretty much anybody who supports threads has pretty good I.O. concurrency, right? Which means that you can uh, make two HTTP requests at the same time, or you can make two SQL requests at the same time. And that tends to work in MRI. And unfortunately, as we have gone from mostly CPU bound to mostly I.O. bound, right, so more and more people are making requests to the Twitter API, or long requests to SQL databases, right, as we do more and more of this, the fact that we just never bothered to care about threads in any of our libraries starts to matter. And we've sort of patched it over and ignored it by not bothering to support threads in our servers. Right? But some people do care, they use JRuby and they run into these issues. So that's what, when you hear people bitching about things, it's usually people using JRuby who care about this stuff and then end up having to write jobs. So what's the result of all this? The result of the poor concurrent semantics is that anybody who cares is using JRuby and running into Java libraries. Because we haven't done a good job of having Ruby libraries that people who care about can use. And some people who care about this stuff use Red Local as a solution. So they uh, understand that threading is a, is a problem, so then they just start using thread locals for everything. And that gets us over a little hurdle and then causes further pain down the road. And I have a couple slides later that show what I mean by that. But there is a lot of use of, there's sort of a, I now understand, and this is sort of a, a generic problem. I now understand that there is a problem, I will just carve a public solution. But you start going down the rabbit hole, people are trying to solve really hard problems, and um, the, the simple solution doesn't always work. Right, so you're, you're trying to throw an 80 20 solution at the 20%. That usually doesn't actually work. Once you get into the 20%, you have to actually know what you're doing. And in general, we use a lot of the 80 20 rule, right? I think that's good for Rails plugins and less good for protocol spec stuff. But even Rails plugins should probably be thinking about not making it impossible to extend with harder things, right? So you can always, it's reasonably simple to write interfaces that can be extended. But we usually don't think about that that much. We usually just hack what we need and we get it done. Um, 
again, I think that this is probably a good, was a good thing for Ruby and Rails that we did this. I think this is something that Rails taught us. But I think we got rolled into a false sense of complacency about it always being the right answer. Monkey patch is another example of this. A lot of like to get stuff done, you're doing stuff, blah blah blah, awesome. Monkey patching is great. Actually, it lets us be productive. It's a thing with you Ruby that lets us be productive. But we use monkey patching a lot in the libraries, right? So on monkey patching apps is fine. Probably submit patches, but whatever. A lot of libraries are like monkey patching at HTTP. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. In ways that are not really compatible. So you end up with very crazy stuff happening because there's a lot of monkey patching and not a lot of submitting patches, right? So I know that we can monkey patch. That's great. It's a good feature of Ruby. But you can also submit patches to the maintainer, and probably if they're any good, they will get accepted. So you don't have to monkey patch all the time, um, even though it's like I said, a good feature of Ruby. Um, a really good thing about all this, all the things that I just said, that some of which were bad, is that we get rapid implementation of new APIs. So uh, Twitter API comes out, we have a library the next day, right? React comes out, we have a library. Mongo comes out, we have a library. And that means that the Ruby community, especially the Rails community, tends to be ahead of most other languages in terms of like finding out whether Mongo or React or Cassandra or whatever works, right? Because we will have used it. Because someone has written the library. So a lot of the things that I'm saying are bad have this flip side effect of letting us try things out and experiment things fast. Unfortunately, where what, what I think should happen is that once these libraries get done, people sort of have coalesced, we should be moving on to solving the last 20%. Too often these libraries were hacked and someone put together to get something done, put on GitHub, and then nobody ever finishes it. So then there's another one, another one, another one, as someone, as another company feels like they need to use this, you know, React. React is not a good example because Ripple is actually a reasonable library. But, uh, there, are, there are a lot of cases where you just get a lot of churn because people throw up libraries that don't really plan to make it. Like I said, in general, experimentation happens a lot. This is great. I think this can all be summed up by the fact that in the Ruby community, we like to operate outside of our comfort zone. And this is a good thing. I intentionally used a positive version of this, right? There are ways I can say it that would be bad. Like, we bite off more than we can chew, or I can make it, like, there's a spectrum of how, but I think that this is the right way to describe it, right? We, Ruby people like to operate outside of our comfort zone, right? But what ends up happening is that people without adequate expertise in some area end up writing a whole library on that thing. If you don't really know HTTP, it's probably a better idea for you to be working on that HTTP than writing your own HTTP library. That is not part of that you um, <laughs> You should know the thing you're working on, right? If you don't know it yet, there are plenty of libraries you can work on. I think a lot of people feel like the API is not good enough, so they're going to go write their own thing, but then just by definition, because we in the Ruby community are, uh, feel strongly about going out and working on uh, things that we're not, that we don't know yet to learn, right? You know, become a craftsman. This is a thing, and I think this is a great aspect of our community. Um, we tend to do a lot of that. I, I would just encourage people to harness that more as fix existing stuff, and less as build a whole new thing that I don't really know that much about yet. I think it's very hard. One, the reason why I even care about this, honestly, is that it's very hard to tell the difference, right? I can't tell if you actually know anything about HTTP or FTP or React if I see a library, because I can't, I don't know, I myself don't know enough about it to be able to evaluate it, right? So, but you're the one who knows, so just don't do it. So let me show you, I, I have some code examples just to show things that I find particularly egregious, um, just because I wave my hands a lot and I want to show what I really mean. So, uh, this is a common question. You go to Stack Overflow and it says, how to bypass SSL certificate verification? And there's about uh, 150 questions like this on Stack Overflow and dozens on various Ruby mailing lists. And 98% of the time, they tell you to do this. Okay? Open SSL, SSL, equals nine. Why does that work? It works because someone else is saying to whatever library, to the SSL library, that the verification should be verified here, which means, yes, verified, right? But you have now told Ruby because constants aren't really constants in Ruby, right? You have told Ruby that verify peer means don't verify. So now anybody in the Ruby process that tries to tell SSL to verify an SSL cert gets verified none, right? Just to be clear, here's what's going on. That here's how verify peer gets set in the first place. In the C code, it is finding the verify peer, uh, the SSL verify peer macro, and it is assigning that thing, that constant, to a constant in Ruby. This is not something you should be changing, right? This is a in the SSL library, verify peer means is one, incidentally, and when you see that, it means to verify. You should not be changing the meaning of verify peer in order to get around this problem, right? So, 
I get very angry when I see this, but unfortunately, everyone says this. Everyone. That is the canonical solution to this problem, is rewrite the meaning of verify to mean don't verify for the entire movie process. Um, there are solutions to this problem, like actually telling the HTTP not to verify, and oh, I'm sorry that OpenURI doesn't support this in 1.8, it doesn't 1.9, so I guess you have to, if you, don't, if you want to not verify, you have to use NetHTTP for that case, or some other library that supports this feature. I'm sorry. What you should not be doing in general is rewriting the entire process's definition of what verifying means. But it's common, right? So this is, this is an example. Another example, and this is uh, where I talk to Wes, uh, is just overuse of thread locals. So here's the thing that uh, that happened that happens in XCon. So um, what Wes is trying to do is he's trying to reduce sockets, and that's probably not a terrible idea. He's saying he's saying if you want uh, a Google.com port 80 a bunch of times, try not you don't need a new socket every time. Try to reuse the same socket. And um, what he's doing is he is storing the list of all those things. Um, socket key is basically. Uh, it's the host in the port and like some XCon name. Uh, he's storing that, those sockets, in a thread local pool. And the reason why he assumes that that's okay is because he assumes that people are not making multiple requests to the same host in the port in the same thread. If you want to make multiple requests, use another thread, right? Unfortunately, what happens is that there is a way to make multiple requests to the same host in the port in the same thread. And that is, if you get a callback that you have some uh, data ready, you can then go make a request. And so people have noticed that this is an issue in, uh, in Ruby. They use things like XCon, I think Curve does the same thing. Uh, or someone tells them, you should put that HTTP sockets into the thread local. And so they do that, which I think is what Ripple did. Is the people that had this problem. And then they say, wait, I'm having a corrupt handle, which is in fact what is happening, because they are using the same socket to make two requests at the same time. Yeah. So what, they, what Ripple did is they created an object called a pump. Um, and if you want to look at this code, it's uh, mind-bendingly crazy. What the pump does is you initialize it with a block, and then it makes a, a new fiber, which uses threads in Ruby 1.8 and in JRuby, that just essentially does a loop. And whenever you resume the fiber, it will go call the block. So basically, uh, it seems like all it's doing is calling a block inside a fiber. That is, in fact, all it's doing. Why is this happening? So after the first time I saw this code, I said, what is going on here? Why is someone doing this? Why is somebody uh, creating a fiber just called a block? That seems like the same thing as calling a block. Well, the reason why they're using doing this is because XCon and their own implementation and other things are using sockets and thread locals. So they're using this crazy hack here to get a new set of thread locals so that they are storing the socket in another place. Right? So what we have here is somebody uses thread local to get around the threading problem without really solving the problem fully then results in somebody doing very, very crazy stuff. Right? This is actually insane. <laughs> what should you do? So there's a known solution to this problem that everyone else uses in the world. Uh, nobody uses thread locals for this, by the way, any other language. Uh, everybody uses pools, some kind of uh, socket pool. You probably know Rails as a connection pool. I'm just, I just have an implementation here just so you can look at it. Uh, so make a, uh, make a new socket pool and uh, default the socket pool to a queue. Um, set the max and uh, make new text. So yes, I know that this requires understanding how threads work. Um, unfortunately, you cannot write red zip code without knowing how threads work. <laughs> 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 um, and that's sort of the problem. Right? We're trying to make that possible, and I don't think it is. And I think uh, when you're writing the HTTP library, you need to be able to write red zip code. So, um, so then there's a socket pool, and the, uh, the checkout method basically just goes, it synchronizes, it goes in and gets the queue out of the socket list, right? And it says, if I've already made, if I haven't made that many, then um, make a new one, otherwise pop something off the queue. And check-in does the same thing. So I don't, you don't need to look at all this code to understand how it works. Put it on, I put it on slides just to show that it's not a lot of code. Actually, a small amount of code. And part of the reason why it's a small amount of code is that Ruby has a primitive called Q, which already handles the hard part of this, which is I want to make sure that I have, at most, I've created five sockets for Google.com for 80, and I want to make sure that if I can't, if I've already made five and I can't make any more, that the person who wants one has to wait until they get it. And basically, so basically, what the Q object does is uh, you have an object. That looks like an array, you call pop off of it. If there's nothing in the queue, it just waits on the thread. If you throw something into the queue, then the thread will 
be woken up, notice that it has received something, and then move on with its life. So there is this object called Q, very simple, solves like a large number of threading problems, and you don't really have to worry about like doing condition variables and signaling and all this stuff. All you do is you just have something listening on a Q, and then you push it to the top. Treat it like an array that happens to block. Right? So um, the nice thing also is that most of you don't have to care about this. Most of you should just use NetHDD or XCon or Curve or whatever, and they should already handle this. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't. Right? So you end up in a situation where if someone wants if someone wants to share sockets, then they end up doing a weird thing. And I should point out, NetHDD doesn't actually solve this problem. It just says you're going to get a new socket every time you ask for one. If you want to share a socket, just have an object that you care about threads yourself. So you get back an object that has the that is Google.com port 80, and if you want to make another HTTP request, you make it on that thing, and you can share it however you want. Um, there, it's probably better to find some way to do a pool or something like that, but uh, probably not better to use it. Another general problem, and this may be sacrilegious uh, as well, is we use inheritance too much. And what do I mean by too much inheritance? So here's an example from Rails. I can probably get you a group here by writing on Rails. Um, so here we have an active model named that inheritance string. There is no earthly reason why this thing should inherit a string. It's it is not a string. Maybe in some sense of the word. There's a large amount of code that it implements. It is not a string, and implementing from string does not provide a lot of value. Um, but you might ask, why do I care? Right? Uh, what is the damage from inheriting from string? What is the danger of that? So the danger is a, a problem that is known as fragile base class. Um, I encourage people to go read this Wikipedia article and the links that are linked to all of it. But essentially, fragile base class is a problem that occurs in object-oriented programming and occurs on mass in Ruby in ways that I think most people don't reason about super well. So the problem is a problem uh, that is caused by a feature of Ruby and Java and a lot of other other languages called open recursion. And basically the way open recursion works, and this, in the, I'm going to show you an example of why we want it to work this way, right? We have a, a class, and that class, you can see the top method dispatch, calls 2A at the end, and we implement the method 2A to do some behavior, right? And open, what open recursion does is it says if you have a, a subclass of action control metal and you implement 2A yourself. When this slide calls 2A, it will call yourself. It will call the, the class that you have the subclass. It will not call 2A on the parent, right? And in the case of action control metal, actually, we want that to be the behavior. We are creating 2A. The reason we're not implementing it right now, we're calling 2A, is expressly because we want people in subclasses to be able to override this behavior, right? So we are using the feature of open recursion in a way that is convenient and useful and provides value. So basically, what open recursion is, is you have an object which has a class, right? Uh, dispatch is being called from the outside world on the controller object, and it basically goes up and says, oh, that, that method is on action controller metal, so it calls it, right? And then action controller metal invokes 2A, and the important thing to realize is that it basically goes all the way back down the inheritance chain, right? So that when you invoke something, it's invoking it dynamically. It's invoking it as though it invoked it from outside the object. It doesn't know that it's inside the object, so it calls it from the bottom. And that gives us this nice feature here of us being able to override 2A to work around some bug because specifically we wanted that behavior. Because we act because Rails uh, wants to give you that feature. And that is a, uh, it's so common that there's a pattern called like template, the template pattern or something, which is what Rails implements, that it, which gives you an object that we're supposed to inherit and then implement methods to provide certain behavior. Right? So this is a common mode. Unfortunately, it also, on the flip side, if I didn't intend for you to do that, it can have unintentional results. So um, here's, let's say I inherit from hash, and I implement the method find entry, right? And that's fine. I, I implement find entry and a bunch of other stuff, and that's great. And Ruby doesn't ever call find entry, so everything's fine, right? And then imagine that Ruby 2.0, they add a method called find entry and start calling that method randomly. All of a sudden, my code, which worked fine until now, explodes because it's called fine entry. I had no way to know that fine entry was a It wasn't reserved, right? No one ever told me I couldn't use it. But now it's becoming an API from the super class of, of, of a new version. So that's, that, in a nutshell, is what fragile base class is. It's, there is a base class that I inherited from, and it starts calling methods on me instead of itself, right? It doesn't know that I went to fine entry either. And that causes explosion. That causes problems. And this is pretty normal. Use Rails, you will find that you sometimes implement a method on a superclass that you didn't mean to implement, and Rails didn't expect to implement, and explosion happens. And basically, um, 
the whole problem is that open recursion is a good feature, but sometimes we don't want it. So we, when, when we want it, we're usually pretty explicit about it in the documentation, or should be, and when we don't want it, we are, but we can't stop it from being used anyway, right? So um, one problem is that it is not documented anyway, right? So even if you want to go upgrade to Ruby 2.0, it would probably never tell you, FYI, here are new methods, please make sure if you subclass and use them, you need to fix that now. And this problem happens in Rubinius, right? So Rubinius is a, an OO implementation of Ruby. So the thing to realize here is that um, Ruby 1.8 and 1.9 do not implement OO hashes, right? There is, uh, the way that you would expect it to behave is that there would be uh, a reject would call the brackets method, or some method that would be the underlying method. If you implemented that, reject would call that. But that's actually not how Ruby works. It is how Rubinius wants to work, but Rubinius can't work that way because breaks things, right? So what ends up happening is uh, Rubinius has exposed this en masse. A lot of people run into this when they try to use Rubinius. Uh, but it is a problem that could exist in any version of Ruby that introduces new methods, right? So uh, this is the same diagram that I showed you before, right? So reject calls on, on my instance of hash. It calls off into hash, and then you inspect hash to call brackets, but no, that actually isn't what happens. Um, Ruby's core classes don't provide any intentional open recursion hooks to take advantage of. So basically, there is no benefit to subclassing Ruby hash. Right? The reason we would normally subclass it is if that behavior works, but it doesn't. So subclassing Ruby hash only provides pain. It only provides if Ruby ever adds this feature or Rubinius adds this feature, crazy stuff happens. So if you have a desire to use open recursion, because for instance, Rails provides an API to a Totally do that. That is the right time to use inheritance. If you are not using that feature, use composition. Right? So specifically, there is a way to handle this problem that is instead of inheriting from hash, compose of a hash. A lot of people have said hey, composition over subclass a million times, you've probably heard it a million times. This is what it means, right? You avoid the problem of open recursion happening randomly by not <coughs> inheriting. And the only problem with that, the only time it really matters is if in the case of Rails, where sometimes you want it to work and sometimes you don't. Because Ruby hasn't actually given you any way to, to make use of this feature, there is no reason to subclass hash. There's no reason to subclass string. There's no reason to subclass array. So typically don't do it. If you do it, you're like, be aware of this problem. And know that when you upgrade Rubies or try to make it work on Rubinix, this is a large, uh, this is a likelihood of what could break. I want to close by listing a bunch of new, what I would call new rules for Ruby, but really they're old rules. Um, there are rules that you've probably heard a lot from other people doing all languages or even inside Ruby. I just want to list them for completeness to canonize what I've said already so far. So, uh, in general, I'm using the same style of favor x over y. That doesn't mean y is not good. It means at this point in Ruby's history, we should care about the thing on top. Um, so, favor completeness over quick release. Now, I wouldn't have said this five years ago. I think five years ago, getting any HTTP library out was a good idea. Uh, but today, we actually need to finish some of them. So, um, maybe in five years, we'll, we will want to spend more time on a quick release. But in 2011, we really need to finish some of these libraries. We need to not get something out there that solves the 20 rule. We need to not make another test library. Um, we need to finish the ones that we already have. Uh, cooperation over an editor. So, uh, there is obviously the case that sometimes NIH is a good idea. And I'm not saying that it's never a good idea. In fact, um, Evan, who suggested this wording to me, Evan Phoenix, is a person who rewrote Ruby, right? So um, <laughs> sometimes it's an okay thing to rewrite things. But you should think long and hard about why you're doing it. I was happy that Wes gave a list, right? Make sure you have that list and that it is, it is not easily debunked before you go into an NIH. It is actually possible to submit patches. It is even possible today to make a fork. So I would prefer forking a library that already exists and adding your patches to starting from scratch. We, we've done that a lot. And at this point, we should make do with what comes along. Now, at some point, you may find that there are very good reasons to start over. And in that case, go do it. But commit to maintaining the thing that you start. Right? At this point, it, it's not useful for someone to say, this robust library that already exists doesn't meet my needs for these six reasons. I'm going to release a library that solves my 80%, and anybody else who has those same six reasons, like, oh well. Right? You need to actually commit to releasing and maintaining when you do an IH. And I think uh, the reason why I'm not upset at Evan or Wes or 
many of the other people, or myself, who do, occasionally does NIH, I broke artifice when fake web existed, right? And why did I do that? I did that to promote, to make it more stable over time. So artifice and, uh, sorry, um, fake web and sham wrap and the things that already do the same thing, all do it in a way that is, that is brittle and will break in the next version of the week. And I didn't want that, so I had a good reason. I would be happy to get my packages in, right? Um, so just make sure that you're willing to maintain it. Right? Make sure that if you do NIH, and you have a good reason for doing NIH, that you're willing to maintain the library. Of course, if there's a robust library that's not maintained, uh, <coughs> probably either take over maintenance or apply to NIH. So this is a little more uh, controversial, probably. I, um, and I, again, I spoke to Aaron, who, run, who runs No Kahiri and uh, Site, which, is, which are uh, binding to LibSML and Libyano, about this. Um, to, to make sure that I was saying the right thing here. Um, I think there are some cases where the world really needs to share. So XML is a complicated problem. It's great for the world to share with XML. Um, YAML is a pretty hard problem, although I think it could be done in Ruby. Um, but like, YAML is a hard enough problem. Everyone's sharing things, and that's great. You should use that. But there are other problems like HTTP that while they are definitely complicated and have a bunch of moving parts, at the end of the day, they're not so complicated that we can't have it in Ruby. Now, I want to make a point that I think you probably haven't heard before about writing things in pure Ruby. Um, I'm not, I don't, I, I, it is the case that is the only way to get things working reliably across all implementations. But the more important thing is that we have to make a choice as a community right now, actually, between having a fast VM with slow C uh, extensions or a slow VM and fast C extensions. MRI is a slow VM with fast C extensions. Rubinius and JRuby are fast VMs with slow C extensions. We have to choose between those two things. That is the choice. And that means that if we rely heavily on C extensions, we are in either slow VM with fast C extensions or fast VM with slow C extensions, and the common denominator is slow, right? Um, we will never be able to get very, very fast running Ruby programs that rely on C extensions in Ruby, period. So, as a result, we need to write more things in Ruby. That doesn't mean that today it will be faster than the equivalent run, running in C, even in Rubenius. What it does mean is that if you want to actually get to the point where Ruby is running fast, where we be proud of the performance of Ruby, which I think is actually going to happen, I think both JRuby and Rubenius are uh, moving, getting in the right trajectory to make fast Ruby. We will need to actually depend on C extensions. Um, and I think uh, for stuff like LibXML, it's okay because the problem is hard enough that we should be willing to accept the trade off there. I have only a couple more slides. I know people are itching to get out of here. So, uh, diligence over apps. The best example of this is that verify peer thing, right? I know that verify peer works. I know that everyone calls it a hack in the Stack Overflow post. My hack, where do I put the hack, right? Don't put the hack, right? Just <laughs> Figure out if people are complaining that SSL sucks on Ruby because some library overrode Verify Peer, we should be reevaluating why we're doing that. Why the entire ecosystem has gems that are rewriting the meaning of what Verify means, right? We should be revisiting that. And we need to, as a community, if we're writing a hack into a if we're writing a hack into our library, we should really think much longer and much harder about it. I get that it makes things work, but it means that people literally say constantly SSL sucks on Ruby, and this is really the only. Evaluated, I've investigated a lot what people mean by this. What they mean is crazy shit happens with certs. I don't know how to make it work. And it's because of this problem. So just stop doing it, and in general, don't do that. Um, I already described this in some detail, composition over inheritance. This is a totally not new idea, but it's so easy in Ruby to like monkey patch your way around problems that, or like just, you know, I'll just work on GitHub and fix that problem when anything comes out that people don't think too much about it. As a person who writes a lot of libraries, I can say that I have had a lot of luck keeping things stable via using composition with public interfaces. Um, you have to use composition, you have to compose things that have public interfaces, right? You compose objects that don't have public interfaces, you're back in the same problem. But most people do a better job of exposing public interfaces via the object boundary itself than via what is available in the subclass or what methods are called. And then I have one last thing, and this sucks, seems sort of out of place compared to the high, the high level of everything else, but I think this is somewhat important. So Ruby itself does a very good job. I have two slides left. Um, Ruby itself does a very good job of giving you a low-level non-blocking I/O. So the I/O object in Ruby actually does is knows how to handle Ruby non-blocking. 
bunch of, like, all the low-level APIs do this. And Ruby one might solve a couple of niggling issues with this, right? But almost everybody who builds an other level API, and this includes the standard library, stuff like NetHTTP, build libraries that assume that if you make a request from an HTTP server, you get back a thing you have to run on. There is no API for give me a chunk of that. And what that means is that people who are building concurrency primitives like reactors around it can't just use NetHTTP. They can't just say, I'll use NetHTTP and I'll follow you down block and I'll get chunks and I'll you know, go in a loop, which would be great. They instead have to rewrite EM HTTP client. And the reason for that is because of this. So when you're writing a library which uses under the hood Ruby IO, Ruby socket, right, you're building another, yet another HTTP client. Um, think about how to build an IO that lets you say, I want another 100 bytes. Because it actually will let other people who are not you, but who care a lot about this problem like William, um, write abstractions that work better with the existing libraries. I don't like the fact that we have to write the blocking and non-blocking version of every library when Ruby itself under the hood provides the features that we need to make this work well. So in closing, uh, Solving for the age 20 rule provides a really good burst of productivity, and we benefited a lot from that. But at some point, the language ecosystem needs to solve the last 20%. And I think we're there. I think we're at the point where we have to solve the last 20%. So, let's grow up together. Uh,